I hope you're having a great day. We have just completed another service. We talked from the subject title, Back to School. And many times God sends us through an obedience test, but for Abram, this was his final exam. The Bible says after these things, God did test Abram. And I'm grateful to announce that Abram, he passed with flying colors, that he was called to take his only son to Mount Moriah, and there he sacrificed him for the Lord. But more importantly, he obeyed the voice of God. And because he obeyed God, God performed a miracle for him. And I believe the same God that existed in Abraham's day is still on the throne today and is waiting to perform a miracle for you. So I want you to check out the message in its entirety. I also, again, want to thank you for joining Evangel Nation. So many people have come through the church, have sent encouraging messages, and we're so grateful for the support that we have all over the country and all over the world. So thank you in advance. Listen, we're praying for you. We're in a 21 day time of prayer and seeking the face of God. And we're believing God to perform what seemed to be impossible in the days to come. So check that out too. Send in your prayer requests and we'll love to see God work on your behalf. Until next time, be encouraged, stay safe, peace. Chapter 11, verse 17 through 19. It reads, by faith, Abraham, at the time of testing, offered Isaac back to God. Acting in faith, he was as ready to return the promised son, his only son, as he had been to receive him. And this after he had already been told, your descendants shall come from Isaac. Abraham figured that if God wanted to, he could raise the dead. In a sense, that's what happened when he received Isaac back alive from off the altar. I want to take a few moments just to continue talking from the subject title, Back to School. I couldn't think of the subtitles. I had two subtitles. This is the final exam, and this is also obedience school. I, I want to make sure you understand that this is one and the same. Because typically, we're going to be educated by God. Because out of all the things God is, one of the things God is unmistakably, and that is a teacher. Yeah, there are many questions that surround Christianity. Some of the questions have to revolve around the subject of struggle. There are some people that are under the assumption that Christians should never struggle. There are others that believe that in Christianity, you should always struggle. Because struggle, in their minds, is the only street that brings you closer to God. And then there's others that have a more balanced perspective. That as long as we live in this life, Blessing and suffering exist. That you really can't have one without the other. That in this life, sunshine and rain will be your portion. And as we look through our scripture, we see some consistent patterns. That God has the ability to turn what appears to be chaos into a classroom. Some of us even on this morning are in a chaotic position, but God uses our chaos as a classroom. Sometimes he uses our torture for a teaching. Yeah, because many times we are confronted with tests. And really, life's tests come without our permission. They're beyond our decision, and sometimes they're beyond what we deserve. 
In fact, a real test comes outside of our timing. Because sometimes we don't have a problem with the test as much as we have a problem with the timing. And most of the tests that I see through our scripture, God does not give them a 30-day notice with the syllabus. But most of the tests I see through our scripture, they come unexpectedly. In fact, it seems like after Jesus had just fed the multitude, that they get on a boat and head to the other side and unexpectedly, a storm breaks out. And so that's encouragement to us that no matter what we're facing, that there's a good chance that God is behind it because God many times gives us tests unannounced. Let me go ahead and make this clear that you got to understand this, that the Bible says that God does not tempt, but God does test. And it happens unexpectedly. And some of you are facing some stuff today that you said, Pastor, I didn't see it coming. But I would love to see it go. Yeah, because testing occurs unexpectedly, but the tested are never unprepared. Let me say that again. I said testing occurs unexpectedly, but the tested are never unprepared. If this test be of God, what I'm communicating to you is that you're more prepared than you think you are. I wonder how Abraham would have perceived his struggle if he knew it was only a test. Because the enemy tests you to fail you, but God tests you to approve you. What if what you're going through is really a test? What if it's really an opportunity for God to get glory out of your life? Because I know what some of your prayers have been in private. You don't even have to tell me. I'm going to operate in word of knowledge right now and just stop me if I'm wrong. Some of your prayers in private have been, Lord, promote me. Yeah, Lord, I'm tired of being on this level. Um, take me to another dimension. Take me to a greater height. Give me a greater anointing. I want greater power. Has anybody prayed that besides me? Well, if you haven't prayed it, you might want to start praying that God on um, this job is great, but I need a raise. Anybody pray that besides? Well, wait till you have a few kids. You'll pray it if you haven't prayed it yet. You'll pray like you've never prayed before. But the reality is when we pray for promotion, we don't recognize that we're simultaneously praying for a test. Because many times God answers our prayer for promotion with a test. And so perhaps the test that you're facing is just a response to the prayer that you pray. Because God will never promote what he hasn't prepared. And so maybe your struggle is because God heard your prayer. But since God is faithful and God will not put more on you than you can bear, he has to establish that you're able to handle what he's called you to. Because many times he will test you before he puts you on the show floor. So hear this. When we ask for promotion, sometimes God will send I want to remind you that faith is not belief without evidence. But it is belief without reservations. It's belief without reservations. You can take notes on that. It's not belief without evidence because according to Hebrews, we recognize that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. So when you have faith, you also have evidence. If I was old school, I'd take a moment and say, you can't make me doubt them because I know too much 
about them. That's what grandma and them said. I, I know too much about them. But the truth of the matter is sometimes when we're going through a test, we begin to question our faith. That's why you got to learn how to recall it to your mind so that you can have hope. This, this, this is the main idea I want to present to you is that obedience is trusting the Lord sees more than we can. Obedience is trusting God sees what we can. I know there's some of us that have perfect vision. Some of us have x-ray vision. Some of us have impeccable vision. But we have to trust that God can see more than what we can see. See, God doesn't just see to the corner like most of us. God knows how to see around the corner. And I'm grateful that God can see more because the Bible says that heaven is his throne and that earth is his footstool. That means the higher he is, the more he can see because of his perspective. And so I'm glad I serve a God that's not blind. I'm glad that my God can't just see the present, but my God can see the past and the future. And there's some things that God can see in us and around us that we can't see ourselves. The first thing God can see is our makeup. Everybody say makeup. I'm not talking about your foundation today, so just take a deep breath. But God can see our makeup. He can see the fiber of every part of us. He can see our makeup because he made it up. I love this text because when it opens in Genesis chapter 22, this is the same story. I read a paraphrase, but in Genesis chapter 22, the Bible says, after these things, God did tempt Abram. After these things, the question you got to ask yourself if you're going to be a Bible student is, what are these things the Bible is talking about? Because you have to understand this according to my understanding that Abraham wasn't new to this. But Abraham was true to this because Abraham had already experienced tests from God. That when Abraham was living in his father's house, God commanded Abraham to leave his father's house and go to a land that he was going to show him. So he calls him out of a life of idolatry and familiarity. And then we understand that God also challenges him with co-workers. Because he had a nephew by the name of Lot. And as God began to increase them, it wasn't enough room for two sheriffs in one town. And so they came up with the conclusion that we have to break up. And so Abraham does something that's very strategic, that's very boss. He says, wherever you go, I'm going to go the opposite. Because what Abraham understood, the blessing is not on the land, the blessing is on me. So wherever I go, the land is going to get blessed. Um, See, you know that you're favorite when you can give your opposition the preference and still come out on top because God's favor is on your life. So Abraham had been tested before. He saw God take a desert and make it bloom. Then he saw Sodom and Gomorrah burn where Lot chose to settle because when God's hand is on you, nothing can stop you. I came here to tell you that just like Abraham, you've been tested before too. Abraham was tested when he went down to Egypt, when he experienced fame and Abraham was tested. I wish I could say Father Abraham passed every test, but the truth of the matter is Father Abraham did not pass every test just like you haven't passed every Test. Abraham goes down to Egypt because he's experiencing a famine and he realizes he's married to a good looking woman and he realizes that that might cost him his life. So he said something that is half true but completely a lie. He says, tell them you're my sister. See, a lie has everything to do with your intentions. It's when you intend to deceive. Yes, she was his half-sister, but also, yes, she was his wife. And so Abraham makes a 
reckless decision. But aren't you glad that God is so gracious that God covers Abraham even when he makes a bad decision. He begins to deal with the Pharaoh and say, you got to give this man back his wife. And then he even calls Abraham a prophet. Aren't you glad that God knows how to cover you when you uncover yourself? Aren't you glad that God will bless your mistakes as long as you don't mistake his blessing for his will? Aren't you glad when you messed up, he still calls it to work out for the good because some of you acting like you passed every test that God has given you. But can we all be honest and take a moment and pause for the cause just to celebrate God covered us when we fell short? Because just like Abraham, we're people of faith, but we don't always get it right on the first time. And sometimes our fear makes us make decisions we wouldn't normally make. And so like Abraham, we sacrifice people who we should be protecting. And Abraham even is tested because he recognizes that Lot has come under attack. And Abraham has to go rescue his nephew Lot, he had to go rescue somebody that seemingly had done him dirty, somebody that, that seemingly did not need him. You, you know you're tested when God has you rescuing who, people who have been in opposition to you. Yeah, that's, not, that's when you know you've been tested. Isn't it amazing that Joseph had to save the same people that threw him in the pit because it's only a test. God's trying to see if your feelings are going to move you or your faith is going to move you. It's only... A test. And so Abraham has been tested. Abraham had to go beyond his feelings and say, listen, let's get all my men. Let's get all of my influence and let's go get Lot back. And he brings Lot back and then he gets tested again because there are men that are trying to give him treasure and trying to bestow value upon him. He said, listen, if you help me, they're going to think that you bless me. But I know whose hand is on my life. And so I'm going to give God room to bless me. It's not that I don't appreciate the offer, but I want people to know that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be. So Abraham passed that test because everything that glitters is not gold. Abraham passed that test. And so Abraham has a series of tests and Abraham gets discouraged. How many of you have gotten discouraged with your walk with the Lord? If you've never been discouraged, you just haven't walked long enough. But if you walk long enough with the Lord, there's going to come a time where you feel a little discouraged. When your praise is a little bit less than what it should be. When your hands don't go up as high as they should be. When you don't run around the church because you're tired of... I'm going to leave that alone. But the truth of the matter is all of us have a moment when we are discouraged. And so Abraham is getting older. He's pushing 100. And he says, Lord, now I know you want to give me a son, but I don't see a son yet. He says, how will I know you're going to keep your promise? Anybody ever had a moment like that? Because maybe, God, I heard that word after eating pizza late at night. Maybe that word really didn't come from you. I need some confirmation that I heard from you and not another because faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God but if it's not your word I don't have a basis for faith so God confirm your word anybody ever had a moment where you needed God to confirm what you heard years ago because it seems like it's not going to come to pass any longer you need God to confirm his word to remind you that his delay is not his denial so what happens Abraham says God how will I know God says I'm about to cut a covenant with you I'm about to cut a covenant with you. I'm about to show you. I'm about to pass through all of these dead things that you split up. But, but Abraham couldn't even have that without dealing with some vultures, without dealing with some buzzers. And some of you have been fighting off things that's been trying to steal your covenant, that's been trying to steal your promise, that's trying to steal what God has said. But you got to be like the color purple and understand that all your life, sometimes you're going to have to fight. And that progression in the kingdom does not come without opposition in other words Paul compares faith to a good fight sometimes you're going to have to fight to preserve your faith let me help you out there's some people you're going to have to turn down so you can hear God more clearly you got to fight for your faith and so Abraham is tested because how will he know when God Shows up and shows out and gives him a covenant that says, listen, I will die before my word fails. 
He reminds Abraham that he is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he's going to bring it to pass. Has God ever confirmed a word for anybody in here? It doesn't matter who else believes your word. If you don't believe it, it's going to be problematic. And so God sends Abram confirmation. And then he still has to wait. It brings us to this point that we are at today. (laughs) That Abraham, after all of these things, God tested him. Some of you feel like you've been in a series of tests, but the last test prepared you for the current test. This is how God knows how you're going to respond because he's already tried you because you can't trust what you haven't tested. And so some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because tests many times prove that you are genuine. Yeah, you can say you're genuine, but tests really prove that you are who you say you are. You can tell me you're going to love me as long as the clouds and the sky is blue. But once it turns gray, it may cause you to renege on your promise. And so God will send tests where he'll ask you the question, can you stand the rain? To see if you're really genuine or you're a chameleon, you just change with the environment. So some of you know that. Some of you are baller shot callers. I know who I'm talking to. I pastor a church that has great resources. Every now and then, you got a wad of money. You got some cash in your pocket. I know most of you all use plastic, but the ancient time, in ancient times, people used paper. And so they would pull out a dollar and, or a $20, and you know you ball it when you pull out a Benjamin. And, and, and you give it to the cashier. And what the cashier will do, the cashier will put it in the light. Yeah, yeah, she would. They'll put it in the light to see if that bill is genuine because I can't deposit something that's not genuine. That's why some of you have people loving you and you still feel empty because what they're giving you is not genuine. And so, watch this if they have to check a $20 bill, if they have to check a $100 bill, what makes you think God's not going to test you to see if you're genuine? Can I say this? Let me go ahead out here since I'm out here. Some of you have confused genuine with perfect. Genuine and perfect are not the same things because there's some fake things that are without flaws, but then there's some genuine things that got some scratches, that got some bruises, and God's saying, listen, don't let your imperfection talk you out of the fact that you are genuine. That's the difference between Peter and Judas. Judas had flaws, so did Peter, but Peter was genuine. He was genuinely flawed. Flawed. And God is talking to some of you on today and saying, listen, even though you're flawed, you're still genuine, and I'm testing you to see how genuine you are. Some of you got to be honest and say, Pastor, I'm not without flaws nor falls. But the Bible says a just man falls seven times. But this is what makes him genuine. He keeps on getting back up and getting back in alignment. Sometimes your fall becomes a test to see how you're going to respond to your mishap, to see how you're going to respond to your mess up. God wants to see if you're genuine. Because sometimes the goal is to be genuine, not to be perfect. Because sometimes trying to be perfect or appear to be perfect, it'll make you phony. And that's why some people don't go to church because we're so busy trying to appear perfect that they see us as plastic when we think we're not. Sometimes God will put you in the light. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. Anybody ever gave a cashier a $100 bill or a $20 bill and for a split moment you said, God, please let it be genuine. Because I didn't check it before I put it in my pocket. So I don't know what they're going to get. And God said, that's the same way I test you. That's the same way I tested Abraham. I had to see if he was genuine. Yeah, he hears you singing, I love you more than anything. He said, you do? Let me put you to a test to see if you're genuine. He hears you saying, God, you're my priority. He says, I am. Let me put you to a test to see if you're genuine. You sing songs like, I'm going to love you forever. God said, for real? Let 
Let me put you through a test. Just to prove to you. Because I already know that you're genuine. Let's be honest. All of us in here have not always been perfect. But the reason we're still here is because we're genuine. When we said, God, I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. I'm going to serve you with my mess ups. I'm going to serve you with my hiccups. I'm going to serve you with my letdowns. But you're going to be my God. You're going to have to take me in all of my imperfections. John Legend can love some imperfections. I believe God can love some imperfections too. Yeah. Yeah, he's looking for a church without spot or wrinkle, but you can't be a church without spot and wrinkle without first being genuine. Yeah, and so he tests Abraham to make sure he's genuine. Look down your road, see if you can detect any phonies. God. Making sure we're genuine. David was not perfect, but David was genuine. Yeah, Noah was not perfect. Noah was genuine. And isn't it amazing that phony people can't handle genuine people? Phony people get uncomfortable around genuine people because they're about to get exposed. God has called us to be genuine, and so he knows your makeup. Then watch this. He also sees your mountain. The Bible says uh, that Abraham, he goes on this journey for three days, and all he responds with is God sees. He says, I want you to step out because I'm going to show you a mountain. I'm going to tell you which one it is. But you won't know until you get moving. And he says, I'm going to bring you to the mountain. And the name of the mountain is Mount Moriah. Which means God is my teacher. Isn't it amazing that God can teach you a lot of things with and on a mountain? That it's the mountains that we have to struggle with because the mountains many times seem like the biggest obstacle in our life because for Abraham, the obstacle is where he was going to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. I love Abraham because Abraham has so much faith that before he gets to the mountain, Abraham has to travel three days. The Bible says that he saddles his own donkey because Abraham is eager to follow God. But God already sees your mountain. This is why you have to understand this, that there were other mountains there, but God helped them select his mountain. So this shows us that even though you desire, you can always select your tests. But you got to trust the teacher to give you the right test. And the thing I love about Abraham is that as they're going up this mountain, the Bible says that Abraham has the knife and he has the fire. And that Isaac, he carries the wood. I want you to know this, that God is so awesome as a type of Abraham that he carries the dangerous stuff because he doesn't want you to be pierced. He doesn't want you to be harmed before you get to your destination. And that's why some of you have the testimony on today that you've been through some hell, but you don't look like what you've been through because God has been faithful to you because he carried the heavy load. And what he's teaching us is that when you're at the right mountain, even though you got to carry something, the owl never put more on you than you can bear. And so all of us are going to have a mountain. And while they're going up the mountain, um, Isaac has to be an older gentleman because Isaac asks him a question. He says, listen, I see the wood. I see the knife. I see the fire. I have a question. Where is the sacrifice? And that's where some of us are right now. We're trying to worship God without sacrifice. But Isaac understood that you can't worship God without sacrifice. And so watch this. Abraham responds and says this, that the Lord will provide for himself or the Lord will see for himself. We see provision, but what the real word means is the Lord will see. And I came in a prophecy out of somebody, no matter what you're going through, the Lord will see to it. Because obedience, again, is believing God sees what we can't see. 
This is why Abraham kept moving because even though I don't know how God's going to bring it at me out, but I know this, what I'm trying to figure it out, that God has already worked it out. So I'm going to keep on moving because of what God said, because I know what God can see. And you won't keep moving forward if you don't believe God can see something that you can't see. I came here to prophesy to somebody that you think you're seeing all there is to be seen. But God says there's more than what meets the eyes if you just trust me. Yeah, he's taking laughter up the hill, but this is no laughing matter. But he only gives laughter this response. God sees. You got to know how to respond to people when you don't have all the details. You got to be able to say that God sees. How's he going to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive? I don't know, but God knows. God sees. And when you know God sees, you can make another step. Because somebody said, God sees. I want you to know that on this morning. God sees. God sees what you think he can see. And while you're walking up the mountain, God is developing you because you are climbing. You're climbing. I remember when I went hiking, one of the blessings was, well, while I was going up, that people were coming down. And I saw that as prophetic because the people that had already been to the mountaintop, they came down saying, you're not far. You're going to make it. It's beautiful. And I came in to prophesy to you. That's the type of church that we need. That while somebody else is climbing up the mountain, somebody else is on the other side of the mountain. Saying, I've been there. You can make it. It won't be far now. If you hold your peace, God will fight your battle. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, no receipt begging for bread. You need somebody who's been where you're going. But he knows the mountain. Job says he knows the path that I take. And when I'm tried, I shall come forth. It's pure gold. I'm on my way to my seat. Give me about five more minutes. And then there's a miracle. Everybody say miracle. Yeah, you can't have a miracle without obedience. Obedience is necessary for a miracle. Yeah. Many times God hides miracles behind obedience. I love this. The Bible says, I'm reading from the expanded Bible. I don't know if you had that translation. It says, then Abraham looked up, lifted his eyes, and saw another male sheep, a ram caught in a bush, a thicket by its horns. Now, I love this because this text is already preaching. It's already full of possibility because when they're going up the mountain, they said the Lord will provide a lamb. But when they get to the top of the mountain, they realize that God has supplied more than just the lamb, that God has supplied a ram. And I came here to tell you that when you get to the top of the mountain, what you see is going to be bigger than what you thought. But we really have to take a moment to have some teaching on Christology because many theologians argue with whether he saw a ram or whether the translation is another ram. Because if he says another ram, that must mean that there is two rams. And since we only see one on this hill, who would be the one that the writer is talking about? And as we come to the conclusion that the other ram is Jesus. And this is why he couldn't go to any mountain. Because he went to this specific mountain because he knew that the same Jesus, who told him to do his son no harm, would be the same Jesus who would be hung there where they would hang him and they stretch him wide. They realized that that would be the same place. And so he says, even though I'm sending this ram, it's prophetic that another ram is coming. And even though you can't celebrate the ram in Abraham's story, I want you to take a few moments to celebrate the ram in your story. Now watch this. I don't want you to miss this because the ram is Jesus. I don't want you to miss this. Let's talk about this test of obedience. Because can I submit this to you? Some of us are burnt out from sacrifice, but we're really not burnt out from obedience. You know, someone said this. That sacrifice does not always include obedience. 
But obedience always includes sacrifice. And this is why this is a test of obedience. It's not that Abraham just came up with the bright idea to sacrifice his son. The reason it's obedience is because God asked him to sacrifice his son. So if you want a miracle, it's not enough for you just to sacrifice. You got to sacrifice because he told you to sacrifice. And that's what qualifies it as obedience. In John chapter 2, they're at a wedding and they run out of wine. So he says, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. That's what Mary says. And watch this. As they begin to sacrifice based upon his instructions, God sees it as obedience and works a miracle. There was a man by the name of Lazarus that died, and he was dead, and Jesus shows up four days late, and he says, go move the stone. Because they obeyed, they sacrificed their strength, but they got a word, it works a miracle. And what I want you to know on this morning, that there is a miracle behind your obedience. Just like there was a miracle behind Abraham's obedience, there's a miracle behind your obedience. And I want to challenge you on today, not to just sacrifice, not to just sacrifice. But sacrifice because of an instruction. See, this is the truth of the matter is tithing is not just a sacrifice. <laughs> tithing is an opportunity. But when you do it, it's classified as obedience. He said, prove me and see when I open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. So when you do it, even though it's sacrificial, you're not just doing it for sacrifice because that's what sucks. Saul learned, it's Saul learned that obedience is better than sacrifice. So when you do it with obedience, now God can bring you a harvest. Because can I submit this to you? It's not going to be your possessions that bring you a harvest. Because the thing that God was after more than anything else, even in the Abraham story, he was after his heart. It's your heart that brings the harvest. And some of us are burnt out because we're sacrificing, but we're not obedient. Obedience is what brings the miracle. Obedience is what brings the miracle. Let me tell you a few stories because I haven't always been obedient. Have you always been obedient? Yeah, yeah I know it's about two people. You just... Glowing with the Holy Ghost on today. You've never been disobedient. I, I remember this. I, I was at a conference. It was the year 2012. I'll never forget it. And uh, I left the house and I went to this conference convention. I wouldn't even tell you what it was. And I was in a different state, in a different city. And my father gave me instructions. He said, listen, um, I need you to go speak to this preacher on my behalf. Right? So I'm in this convention. There's about probably 12,000 people in the convention, and my dad is at home because, you know, he's battling his uh, sickness, and so uh, he watches the stream, uh, and he says, I didn't see you on the stream. That was nothing new because, if you know, these types of conventions, I never sit in the front. <laughs> I always sit in the back. I got to get better. I just haven't learned how to be a preacher that sits in the front, so I'm learning how to be a preacher that sits in the front, and so I was sitting in the back, and he couldn't see me. You don't have to play just yet. And he couldn't see me. He couldn't see me. And he said, he called me up. And he said this. I'm not going to tell you what he called me, but he said, son. <laughs> he said, son, I didn't see you on the stream. He said, didn't I tell you to go speak to this preacher on my behalf? I said, yes, sir. He said, why didn't you do it? Honestly, I didn't think he was serious. So I said, Dad, I can't do that. There's no way I can do it. There's too many people here. He said, just do what I said. And so I did what he said. But watch it. I did it with an attitude like, yo, I'm about to do this and prove to him he's lost it. Because it didn't make sense in my mind. There's no way I'm getting through all these people. Again, I'm in the back of the church. You know 12,000 people, lot of security. Nobody knows me. 
He said, just speak and tell him your daddy said hello. So I'm walking up there. I'm like, Lord, sit. I'm kinda, I kind of want him to be wrong. So I'm not even walking fast. I'm walking slow. And it seems like the crowd that was in front of me, they just start parting. I'm walking slow like... And I'm mad, because I'm like, he about to get me embarrassed. He ain't here to defend me, and I'm just walking slow. And I walked so slow, I actually made it to this pulpit. I made it to the front. And do you not know that the preacher he told me to greet, ironically, was still there? And I shook his hand. And what I realized... Is that it really, you can play now, it really wasn't about me. Yeah, because now that I look back in hindsight, I realize that was the last time he greeted that particular preacher. And he sent me on an assignment that wasn't about me, it was about him. And I'm saying this that a miracle happened, not because I was praying for a miracle, a miracle happened. Because I was walking in obedience. And I want you to know the same way a miracle worked for me and worked for Abraham, a miracle can work for you because you're walking in obedience. Some of you, God's going to speak to you in this time of prayer. And you're going to have to align yourself with what God is saying. Because sometimes we want miracles but obedience is always the foundation for miracles. Some of you even fasting sounds out laying this. God, why in the world would we have to fast? There's already enough starving people in the world. Why would we have to fast? And God say, listen, because I'm trying to set you up for a miracle. Watch this. There was a group of people that were fasting, but they were not fasting out of obedience. And he said, that's not the fast I've chosen for you. I've chosen another fast for you. So when you get an instruction from God, you have to follow because that's the foundation for a miracle. Peter was able to give Jesus his boat because Jesus asked for him. He said, launch out to the deep. It was not launching out to the deep that performed the miracle. It was the obedience that was associated was launching out in the deep. That's another story about a mule. A farmer was trying to sell the mule. Trying to sell the mule. He said, this mule will work hard. This mule will be faithful. It'll do whatever you do to tread and plow the grounds. It'll do whatever you need to do. And before you buy a mule, because mules was often like cars, you have to test the mule. So the potential buyer came to the mule and said, <laughs> Let me lead the mule. He said, does he operate on command? The farmer said, yes. He said, listen, mule, plow the field. The mule just stood there. He said, mule, drive this cart. The mule just stood there. He looked at the farmer. He said, I thought you said this mule obeys based upon command. He said he does. So the farmer, the owner, took out a two by four and hit the mule upside the head. He said, now tell him. The mule responded to the potential buyer because here's the principle. The mule will do what you asked him to do, but first you have to get the mule's attention. And let's be honest, some of us can be as stubborn as a mule. And we really won't obey until God gets our attention. How many of us were running in the opposite direction until God got our attention? How many of us obedience was not our first option? It should have been. But God had to give us our, get our attention. And as soon as we obey, that's when things start happening. And I believe God is calling some people here today because he's gotten your attention. Some of you weren't even planning to come to church on this morning, but somehow a friend invited you, a co-worker invited you, and you didn't even know your steps were ordered 
by the Lord. And some of you are going through some heartache. You're going through some pain. You're going through some struggles. You're going through some trials. And maybe God is using that to get your attention. And my question for you right now is, does God have your attention now? You remember that last time you said that's a close call? He said, God, if you get me out of this one, I'll never do it again. God got your attention. He even let you go. But he got your attention because he wants your heart. He was never after Abraham's son. He was after Abraham's heart. 